Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. This is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the libertarian perspective on the issues of the day. I'm joined, as I am every week, by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to be with you, and I hope uh, our viewers and listeners had a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, and uh, with, with all the trimmings and uh, have reason to give thanks uh, on that memorable uh, annual event. Well, that's a perfect segue to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, you wrote a great article that we published last week uh, on Thanksgiving and the foundations of uh, America's free enterprise system. And so I thought we ought to revisit that. That's, that's, that's a classic story uh, that dates back to, I guess, the Pilgrims. And yeah. uh, so why don't you go ahead and tell us what that story is, Richard? Well, in, in, in a nutshell, uh, the Puritans in Great Britain uh, viewed themselves as being uh, religiously persecuted by the official Church of England. Uh, they felt that the society in which they lived was corrupt, uh, power-lusting, uh, irreverent, unrighteous, sinful. Uh, and so they decided to form a, a group uh, based upon a land grant that had been given by the king to some noblemen, and they made the arrangements to be the ones who would settle there and, and, and tend the land and obviously then uh, share whatever profits may have come with, with the owners of, of the land grant. Um, and so they signed the Mayflower Compact, these Puritans, who decided that they were going to make a new Jerusalem, uh, a new religiously virtuous and pure uh, community in the new world. But if one reads uh, the, 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 the Mayflower Compact and, and the thinking behind it, what one discovers is that they had concluded that the greed, avarice, sinfulness, uh, excessive worldliness uh, of, of the British society from which they wanted to escape was caused by the institutions of that society. A primary one that they came to condemn was private property. Uh, they had read their uh, Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, uh, who in his famous uh, book, The Republic, uh, concludes that, that, that institutions make the man. Uh, the institutions of society determine what people's behavioral characteristics are. So if you have private property, a person is greedy, avarice, self-centered, materialistic, and uncaring about others. And of course, uh, from a religious perspective, the wider issue of what God wants in the community of believers. Uh, do away with private property, uh, live in a society, as Plato laid out for, for certain members of his Republic, the Guardians, uh, a communal existence of shared property, uh, shared work, uh, shared distribution of whatever was uh, produced by, by those in this communal environment. That will change human nature. From the self-interested, you will become the altruistic and other-oriented. Uh, from the greedy, you will become the sharing and caring. Uh, from the avarice, you will be uh, concerned with, with the betterment of the society as a whole and not anything that particularly goes to you. So they set off to the America. And by the way, they actually were thinking of settling in Virginia, but that's what an old sailing ship dependent upon the currents and, and the winds will, will do to you. And they ended up uh, in what today we call Massachusetts. Uh, and that's how they laid out the property. Uh, laid out the, the boundaries of the colony, and it was to communally owned. Now, all of this, by the way, is recounted, as I explained in my article, Jacob, uh, by the then governor of that early Plymouth colony, uh, Governor William Bradford. And he explains that, 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 that uh, the problem started emerging almost immediately. Uh, there would be people who, driven by, by their sense of dedication and belief in this ideal, both religious and institutional, to rise early in the morning, go out to the fields to work industriously from, from dawn to dusk. They would take their sons out, clear the field, be planting the crops, tending the animals, and so on. Uh, but then they would notice that there were other members of the colony who sort of sauntered onto the, onto the fields later in the day did not put their, uh, to use the phrase, shoulder to the grindstone as vigorously and industriously as they were. Now, the reason being, as Bradford explains, is that the lazier and less industrious one said, 
Well, you know, whether I'm there early in the morning or later in the day, whether I work hard or more lazily, I will get an equal share of the total economic pie that we as a community produce. So there is no close connection between work and reward. So why work is much if my reward is no smaller than anyone else's. Now, those who had started out industrious, hardworking, diligent, uh, mindful of being up early to work in the field, became resentful, angry, wondering why should I work as hard as I have been in my son? When those are showing up later and basically, as we would tell you, express it today, goofing off, and they would reshare this, or receive the same equal share as I and my family will. Now, he also recounts this affected the family life. The women resented having to cook for other families, right? A communal eating process that they would have to be considered with cleaning the clothes of other husbands who might be less neat than their own. And uh, the context of this we need to remember is that this isn't throwing it into the dishwasher with the detergent powder. This is going down to the local stream and beating the clothes on the rock until the dirt has gotten out of them. This is hard work. Uh, as a consequence, of, to make a long story short, I, I explain this uh, in obviously greater detail in the article which appeared uh, last week. Uh, Bradford explains that, that the first a harvest season was abysmal. Uh, there was barely enough to feed the colonists. In fact, s many died of starvation. And the same process continued itself for another planting season. And again, many deaths from starvation. The elders of the colony, including Bradford, came together and said, if we, if we have one more harvest season in winter like the last two, surely all of us, or virtually all of us, will die in the wilderness. We must do something else to change the, 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 the framework in which we as the colony members are undertaking our labor. So what they said, they were going to try something new, <laughs> new, I suppose, in quote marks. Uh, and that was they were going to take the collective property of the colony and divide them into family plots. And each family would be informed that whatever they grew on their private farm now was theirs to keep and to use for their own purposes. Whatever animals they might raise was theirs to raise and to keep for their own purposes. And any amounts of food or uh, grown or livestock uh, uh, cared for that was in excess of their own family's requirements, they were free to trade their surpluses with any respective surpluses of crop or livestock with their neighbors. Now what Bradford now recounts is that Beginning with this arrangement of private farming, the husbands and the sons would go out early, virtually all of them on their private individual farms, rise early to go out in the fields, lay the farrows, tend the ground, plant the seed, keep it watered, shoo away the crows, watching it grow. The women would now happily work at home, preparing the food, churn milking the cows, churning the butter, baking the bread, uh, mending the clothes of their own family members. The upshot of it was, Bradford explains, is that at the, at the time of this third year harvest, there was not a, a, a shortage of food, but a great bounty of it, of different types of food grown by different people on their respective farms, various livestock, horses, cattle, pigs, and so on, chickens. The result was there was far more than all of them would need. So Bradford says that they had decided that they were going to give thanks to God for their survival in the wilderness. So bountiful that they could trade some of their surpluses with the Indians in the neighboring forests and even invite some of the Indian tribes to join them in this festival of thanksgiving to God. Now, Bradford explains is that what this taught them is that there is a human nature, that changing the institutions does not change the character and quality of the motives, the mindsets, and the incentive processes of, of the human being. That it was necessary to mold the institutions to be consistent with the character of man. And by doing so, put the actions of men in motion, not just to improve their own circumstances, but in ways that would mutually benefit all through the processes of voluntary trade. Now, so what I, I suggest uh, uh, in this article uh, towards the end is that when we're sitting with when we were sitting with our families 
uh, carving up the turkey, uh, passing out the, the, the gravy, the, 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 the cranberry sauce, the stuffing and so on. We all should recall that besides giving a thanks for family and friends and, 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 and the prosperity uh, we each may have to various degrees, we should also remember that this celebration is marking the birth of free enterprise in America and the demonstration of its superiority over all forms of collectivism and statism. That that is the true lesson of Thanksgiving. Individualism, private property, incentives, and freedom. That was the basis of America. It's what gave America its material and cultural and social strength over 200, over 300 years, which we are slowly losing because of a turn away from freedom and the free market, but which is still a residue, a cultural legacy in us, which we can draw upon to renew ourselves as a free people. Yeah, that's an excellent summary of what happened. You know, the way I look at it is that when they came over here, they, they had these good intentions that it's right to share what uh, your belongings with others. It's wrong to be selfish. It's wrong to have more when others have less. So they said, we're going to establish a society based on we're all in this together. We're going to share and share alike. Uh, but it was mandated. I mean, it's really no different as far as I'm concerned from what goes on in North Korea today. I mean, in North Korea, you've got this socialist system where everybody, you know, works for the common good. Uh, and just like at this time in the early days, North Koreans are suffering starvation. And it's so interesting how, how whenever it happens in communist countries, they, they blame it on famines, they blame it on the weather. Well, that was probably the inclination of Bradford in that first year of, oh, we're just so unlucky that we, we have had you know, harsh winters or bad harvests. Uh, it probably didn't occur to them that this was a framework problem, as you put it, a systemic problem. Right. But, you know, reality has a way of mugging people. And so after the second time, they said, hey, maybe it has more to do than just the weather or something. Maybe it's the framework. And so they changed the framework, as you point out, to one based on private ownership, where now everybody's not forced to, to share anymore. Everybody gets to keep everything he earns. Now, we, we sometimes forget that in this context, as everyone is accumulating now his own wealth, nothing's mandated that he has to share, that we still have the opportunity of voluntary charity, that if there's less fortunate people in society, that people are free to donate to those people. I mean, that's how churches are sustained in America today. Uh, but, you know, to draw the lesson even further, though, Richard, you know, I would say the vast majority of Americans, if you were to ask them, uh, what kind of uh, economic system does the United States have? I think most of them would say, oh, it's a free enterprise country. And yet you have this massive government involvement of government taking care of people. You've got Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, farm subsidies to, to help the farmers, uh, giant public schooling systems that are all of these all of these programs are found in North Korea or in communist Cuba. Uh, so you, so it seems to me that that while Americans are convinced that they have a free enterprise country, what they're really missing is that most of the system or a large amount of the system is based on the same principles that Bradford had, had established in the very beginning and that really formed the basis of the Cuban system and the, and the North Korean system. That government exists, the federal government exists in a large part of people's lives to take care of people. Uh, retirement pay, Social Security, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, health care for people. Education, public schooling, we're here to provide education for people. So that really the welfare state way of life, as far as I'm concerned, is just a variation of what Bradford did in those first couple of years and what the Cubans and North Koreans do today. Another element I, I would like to suggest is, is not this the, the lesson about economic freedom, but the lesson about personal freedom. Uh, it, it is all very well and good, as we have done, to point out the economic lessons that the Puritans in the Plymouth colony came to learn. But there was another lesson that had to be learned from another mistake that they chose. And that was their attitude towards tolerance. 
Now, they wanted to leave England because they felt religiously persecuted. They wanted to be able to establish a community where they could practice their faith, their, 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 their doctrine concerning Christian uh, belief in the way that they thought was a correct interpretation of the Bible. Well, they left for America and they established their colony. But the fact is another attribute that they had was that they believed in religious freedom as long as it was the, uh, you, the freedom to believe as they did. They quickly began persecuting, challenging, attempting to censor, even threatening those who had religious interpretations of Christian doctrine different than themselves. It resulted in prominent people having to leave that Plymouth colony, moving to other places such as Rhode Island uh, to, to form their own colonies because of this intolerance. This is another, we see this happening today again. It's not just the loss of economic freedom that has been going on for a long time. But think of the environment in the United States today with those who advocate political correctness or this radical uh, uh, collectivist statism, uh, this closed dogmatic mindset that we see, particularly in colleges and universities. Free speech is right and good as long as you say and believe and express the ideas that we consider to be the correct ones. Anyone who espouses an idea, a view, a value, an interpretation of events past and present different than ours is to be condemned as an enemy of society, a fascist, a Nazi, a, a threat, uh, someone who's uh, upsetting people because they're challenging their safe space with, with, with arguments that make them question what they believe. Now, it took a long time for those early colonials to realize that that type of intolerance and dogmatism, in this case, in the element of, of religious doctrine, creates tension, animosity, conflict, violence, closed mindedness, that it took the American colonists a long time to overcome and to practice religious tolerance. That is, each individual being allowed to believe and express and proselytize for their interpretation of what God was saying in the Bible without challenging or threatening others with violence or other forms of censorship if they dissented from that particular person's interpretation. We today are facing a new ideological puritanism, if you will, of close-mindedness, intolerance, a willingness to use force, both verbal and physical, to shut down others who believe differently in the debate over right and wrong, reality and fantasy, rights and justice, freedom and tyranny. And we have to realize that that was a problem that they had to overcome too over time. And we are now returning to a secular dogmatic intolerance that the early colonists had to go through and then overcome to the better of America through most of its history. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. Let me, um, I'd like to expand on it and, and uh, explore it more deeply. But first, let me go back to your point about the, the early uh, British colonies that, you know, were inculcated with the notion that this was, uh, that, they, that the colonists embraced f principles of free enterprise and freedom. And as you point out, such clearly was not the case, at least insofar as religious liberty was concerned and, in some, uh, and insofar as some of the colonies were concerned. I mean, these were really bastions of tyranny to a certain extent. And as, as, the, as the libertarian economist Murray Rothbard has shown, there, there wasn't much economic liberty either, uh, that, that there, was, there was highly regulated systems, on, uh, there was mercantilist systems. I mean, they really had not been imbued with the principles of, of free enterprise. Right. Uh, and so, you know, Adam Smith's book doesn't come out, his book, The Wealth of Nations, doesn't come out till 1776 which is the year the colonists declare their independence from Great Britain. So, so when we get the First Amendment to the Constitution, it really is a remarkable achievement because, yes. number one, it's recognizing that Congress, and indirectly the federal government, is your biggest threat to religious liberty. And it, secondly, it's, it's affirming this principle that rights exist in people independent of government, that, that contrary to what public school students are taught and in many private schools too. The First Amendment 
and the Constitution generally do not give people rights. You know, we don't get freedom of religion from the, from the Constitution. These rights inhere in us by virtue of our humanity. They come from us by God and by nature. And so that's why the First Amendment doesn't, by its own words, doesn't give us the right of religious liberty. It prohibits the government from interfering or infringing on freedom of religion. But, but let, me, let me offer, I think, a, 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 a variation on what you're talking about. Uh, in a free society, we would say that everybody's got the right to believe whatever he wants. So in, a, in, a, in an ideal libertarian world, uh, if a university uh, existed, it would be privately funded. Uh, it, the, the money would come from tuition or donations or whatever. There would be no government involvement. So that if a, if a university wanted to be closed-minded and intolerant and, and uh, teach only a particular narrow point of view, we might object to it as, as being a bad point of view, like if they're teaching that socialism is good, we would say, well, that's not really good what they're doing, or if they're intolerant about views, because college, we generally think of college generally as, hey, teaching, teaching students to, have, uh, to be exposed to different views, weigh them, debate them, uh, you know, protest or whatever. But we would argue for the right of that university to be as closed-minded as it wanted, even if we disagreed with its particular point of view. I think the problem with a lot of this is that you've got these state-funded institutions, uh, federally funded, state-funded, and therefore that's where the, 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 the First Amendment comes into play because the First Amendment applies only to government, to the federal government, and then by virtue of the 14th Amendment, it applies to the states. But as long as an institution is privately funded, you know, I say, Richard, they should be free to, to do whatever they want, even though you and I would say, hey, you know, that's not really a good point of view to have. Yes, that's actually the, the case. Now, as, as a libertarian, not just politically, but I like to think culturally and philosophically, uh, I believe in uh, the equality between individuals in terms of their rights. I believe that each individual as a distinct person should be treated with respect dignity, uh, tolerance, uh, in all of my dealings with him as the initial default uh, relationship with him. Uh, but in a free society, we are forced to accept the fact that there may be those who are much more closed-minded, uh, much more intolerant, much more bigoted, if you will. But uh, And if they choose to live their lives, uh, participate in voluntary clubs and associations on that basis, or choose not to interact with various people in different settings in the marketplace as their own voluntary choice of non-association. They are free to. Uh, but that is one of the prices of a free society. The, 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 the response to those who say, but you see, then you're saying that bigotry is good, intolerance is acceptable, uh, disrespect uh, of others uh, are, are to be allowed. The fact is that every, every action bears a cost. In the marketplace, someone may not choose to hire um, Latinos or African Americans um, or, or, or others in society or, or Jews, let's say. Uh, and they can choose only to hire those of a particular ethnic, racial, or religious group. Uh, they can choose not to uh, deal with customers or, or, or suppliers in, in the production side of the market that they choose not to, but there's a cost to that. By doing so, they forego the opportunity of revenues that could be theirs by being more concerned with the color of the money of their customers than the pigmentation of that person's skin. They will lose the opportunity to hire workers, suppliers, who could provide them with the production side wherewithal to be more efficient, cost effective, more competitive, and to earn the greater profits than by locking those people out. And there's always going to be others in the market, as long as the open is free, market is free and competitive, who would say, well, whether I have a prejudice or not, I'm interested in maximizing my money, my profits, my revenues, my market share. And therefore, I'm going to be more concerned with a person's, the color of a person's money. How, what do they want to buy? What kind of products are they interested in purchasing? How can I attract their business? And the same thing in hiring those who participate in the production processes over which they supervise as entrepreneurs and enterprises. 
that tears down these barriers itself surely and effectively over the market. If this was not true, Jacob, if I can just continue with this for a moment, why was it necessary to have segregation laws in the Old South? If naturally people of different races and ethnicities felt desired and comfortable living apart, why would you have to compel separation if it came naturally? This itself demonstrates that if such government-imposed prohibitive laws were not there, people would freely, in their own self-interest and betterments and discovered advantages, political, economic, social, cultural, to interact with others for their mutual gain and benefit, and therefore the natural civil society market-based integration of different members of the society. Now, will some in the society choose to more associate or interact or socialize with some as opposed to others? Well, to be honest, all of us do that to some extent. We pick our friends based upon interests, faith, ideas, hobbies, and so on. We pick the partner with whom we're going to spend our life uh, as a marital or other partner on the basis of choosing values, interests, concerns, attractions of, of that person as opposed to another. There's always a degree of discrimination that is inescapable in anyone making choices. But the question, the important thing is to not allow the government to determine or dictate these things in any way. A person is then free to be a bigot and a jerk, but he cannot control the behavior of others to be tolerant, respectful, associative, freely interaction for mutual benefit, merely because of more narrow-minded attitudes and beliefs. That's the importance of the state staying out and leaving these things to the market. And then truth and justice and right behavior will, in the long run, in my humble opinion, win out. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, if we go back to our very first year of existence, uh, FFF, uh, mm -hmm. you were writing for us on a monthly basis. You were vice president of academic affairs back at that time. We launched you really on this excellent career path that you've had. And uh, <laughs> that we were talking about the right to discriminate in that very first year. And you're right that when you talk about these kind of principles, really a principal case to liber liberty and libertarianism, people hit you with, oh, well, you must be a bigot and you hate Jews or blacks or Catholics or whatever. And we get the same thing with the drug war, of course. Remember that first year we were calling for drug legalization and people say, oh, you favor, you know, drugs for people and you know, drug adult society and drugs for children. And, and the same with the welfare state when we call for the repeal of the whole, you know, socialist gamut of programs. Oh, you hate the poor. Uh, but really all we're talking about, Richard, is a principal case of liberty. And you're absolutely right. All that had to be done was a repeal of segregation laws, which should have been done. They should never have been enacted in the first place. But the reason they were enacted, as you point out, is because a free society naturally tends toward being an integrated society. And that's what bigots in the South were concerned with. And that's why they had to enact segregation laws to mandate that people separate. But the right to discriminate is simply the flip side of the, the right of freedom of association. You have a right to decide who, with whom you're going to associate. And if, if it had just been a repeal of segregation laws, you would have had society naturally tending toward, segre, uh, toward integration, including in the business arena. Now, mm -hmm. does that mean that every business would have done so? No. Some bigots would have said, I don't care how much market share I lose, I'm going to have my bigoted racist restaurant. But so what? I mean, that's the price of a free society. Today, you have country clubs that are free to discriminate against people on the basis of race, color, creed, or whatever. And I'm sure there are some around that still do that. You know, nobody gets all bent out of shape. They sort of become part of the fabric of American society. People accept it as part of a free society. There are protests, which are entirely legitimate in a free society, boycotts that nudge country clubs into integrating, uh, but nobody's forced to do so. And that's the thing about a free society that, that we've got to constantly keep in mind, that the, the right to be free doesn't entail just the right to make the right decision. If people are free to make only the right decision, the moral decision, the responsible decision, that's not a free society. By that test, everybody in North Korea is free. The real test of a free society 
is the right to make the wrong decision, the immoral decision, the irresponsible decision, so long as your conduct is peaceful, as long as you're not raping, stealing, burglarizing, or whatever, directly infringing on someone else's rights. You got a right to make whatever choices in, in your life you want, notwithstanding whether people ex, uh, like it or, or dislike it. Yeah, th there, there's a, a, a line, which I'm not going to be able to quote verbatim, uh, from uh, that great little book on classical liberalism written by Ludwig von Mises, uh, in which he's talking about personal freedoms. He's not just talking about the economic freedom we usually think of, of him as the proponent of, in which he says that, that, that men have to learn not to run to the policeman every time someone else acts in a way that they disapprove of. That takes a lot of, 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 of principled action, not to, be, not to always run to the policeman to censor someone else whose actions or words you find disagreeable. All right. On that note, Richard, we're out of time. Like Richard, I want to wish y'all, I, I hope y'all had a very happy Thanksgiving. It's nice to be back with you. To read Richard's article on the founding of Thanksgiving, come to our website at fff.org. And uh, I write a daily blog there, and we publish many articles, and we, we put out what we consider is an excellent FFF Daily, a daily publication, which is really, we consider the best commentary, op-ed, opinion page on libertarianism uh, on the internet. And we've published it now, oh gosh, some 15 years. Um, so Richard, as always, greatly enjoyed the show and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Until next week.